Thank you, Mary, and welcome everyone this morning to this service of worship. And I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm <laughs> I suspect uh, that many of us are glad that we don't have to make the, uh, the trek to church this morning with the weather outside. So perhaps having the service on Zoom is a blessing. And I will begin with some opening words. We are Unitarian congregation. We are free to contribute our own thoughts about belief. We are free to listen respectfully to all arguments about faith. We respect the wisdom of the ages and thoughts of today as being guideposts on the path to a deeper understanding and faith. And I will now light our chalice candle. This particular chalice is uh, a gift that I was given as a homewarming uh, present. So it uh, has special meaning to me. And I invite you to say the words together on the order of service. We light this candle as a symbol of our faith. By, By its light, may our vision be illumined. By its warmth, By its our fellowship be encouraged. encouraged. And by its and flame, by may our yearnings for peace, justice, and the life of the Spirit be enkindled. And now we shall have Spirit of Life. Spirit of life, come unto me. Sing in my heart all the stirrings of compassion. Blow in the wind, rise in the sea, move in the hand, giving life. 
life the shape of justice roots hold me close wings set me free spirit of life come to me come to Thank you. And now a time for anyone present who wishes to, to share a candle of joy or concern with the congregation. I've lit my candle for Reverend Julian, who is being looked after by her daughter and family, but got very good results from the consultant last Friday when she went to Manchester Royal. And I've lit it for all the other people who are suffering at this time. And we must always remember the NHS workers. Amen. I light a candle of joy this morning. It is now two years since Meg, Alana's daughter, had a fit. I would like to light a candle this morning for the suffering of the people in Myanmar and the ongoing violence, uh, injustice and unrest there. There doesn't seem to be any end in sight. We hold these people in our prayers. If there are no other candles, I would ask that we hold all in our hearts and that may all our prayers, both spoken and unspoken, be heard. And now our first hymn of the morning, please feel free to join in at home and ignore, annoy the neighbours, all from the Green Book this morning, if you do have a copy, number 133, How Can I Keep From Singing? Take it away, Robert. My life flows on in endless song above earth's lamentation. I hear the real, the far off hymn that hails a new creation. Through all the tumult and the strife, I hear the music ringing. It sounds and echoes in my mind. How can I keep from singing? What through the... My life flows on in endless song above earth's lamentation. I hear the real, the far off hymn that hails a new creation. Through all the turmoil and the strife, I hear the music ringing. It sounds and echoes in my mind. How can I keep from singing? What through the tempest round me roar, I know the truth it liveth. What though the darkness round me close, songs in the night it giveth. No storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm clinging. Since love prevails in heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? 
When tyrants tremble sick with fear And have their deaths knell ringing When friends rejoice both far and near How can I keep from singing To prison cell and dungeon vile Our thoughts of love are winging When friends by shame are undefiled How can I keep from singing? Thank you. We even had an extra verse there. <laughs> and now we come to uh, reading this morning, which is from the Psalms. And I think on the order of service, I've said Psalm 85, 10 to 13. It's still a Psalm 85. It'll be verse 4 to 13. Restore us again, God our Saviour, and put away your displeasure towards us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what the Lord God says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. And now we come to a time for prayer. Dear God, in the love of truth and in the spirit of our teacher Jesus, we wake this morning ready to serve our brothers and sisters and to worship you. We give thanks that your love and mercy and justice fills our hearts and guides our souls and minds. But even as you guide us in our actions today, remind us that your truths are seen in this world only in part, as through a glass darkly. To us is not given the certainty of belief, but the gift of faith. So may we always remain open to new light and be prepared to change our beliefs so that we may honour our faith. Amen. And now we'll have the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the <laughs> for thine is the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. And now we have another hymn this morning, number 135, Sing in Celebration.
Jesus set the conscience free. By the tyrant taunted, for the faith derided, they yet stood firm in love and liberty. We who share their vision must share the Extol compassion till humankind become one family. Now, as our introduction to uh, a time of silent prayer and meditation this morning. Um, with all the haikus of David's I've been reading recently, I dug out a small collection of haikus that I, I found in a, a secondhand bookshop many years ago, and I was very happy to be reacquainted with them. And I've just picked three of them to help us put uh, ourselves in a bit of a, a reflective mood this morning. At least that's the aim. So there's just three of them. And the first one, cherry blossoms, yes, they're beautiful, but tonight don't miss the moon. And the second one, it is nice to read news that our spring rain also visited your town. I thought very appropriate for this morning. And finally, and more in tune with the theme of today's service, the speech of insects and the speech of men are heard with different ears. I'm going to leave that there for now, and we shall have a time for silent prayer and our own meditation.
And our third hymn this morning is number 140, 140, The Love of God is Broader. There's a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in God's justice, which is more than liberty. If we rend our love to narrow with false limits of our own, then we magnify the strictness with a zeal God will not own. For the love of God is broader than the measures of the mind, and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. Sorry about that. <laughs> I forget. Our address this morning is entitled Speaking One's Mind. And I have to say, I love the graphic that's been produced for this. I think it's fantastic. But I ought to point out at the outset that like uh, many services that I've been asked to take, I am required to submit to the outline and the title before I have written the main address. Um, but after a couple of drafts, I think that it might better be titled, How to Listen Well, or How to Seek After Truth. We shall see. I shall let you make your own minds up. The real inspiration for the service this morning is about listening to different points of view. It seems that we are always living in interesting times, to borrow a famous quote. There are no end of disagreements about how we think each other ought to be doing things or living our lives. And these disagreements can be over politics, they can be over economic organization, ideas of social justice, or even what it means to be a good person. And the uh, recent examples are numerous. And I'm going to let you think of your own examples for those, I'm sure plenty spring to mind. But I don't believe that we are as divided as is, as is often made out and often to sell headlines. But I think there is certainly less trust between individuals and institutions, which can lead to a withdrawal, a hostility, and an us and them mentality. We're right, those lot over there are wrong. So, why should we listen to others' ideas or opinions, particularly if we believe them to be offensive or even plain ridiculous on first encountering them? For example, uh, the flat earth hypothesis. What is at stake if we simply turn away, retreat, close ranks, and refuse to engage with the other side? with them. But before the why, I would like to examine the how. Many controversial ideas that we now take for granted, that the earth is not the center of the universe, that Trinitarianism is perhaps not wholly supported by scripture, or perhaps more importantly or more relevant to us today, that minority groups in society deserve the same respect and treatment as anyone else. All of these were once dangerous 
and heretical ideas. They needed discussion and examination before they were finally accepted into mainstream thought. And the struggle goes on today. But listening to what is different and discovering and valuing what is true within it is important. I will try to show that what is at stake is not merely the dismantling of our comfort zones, the risk of our having our feelings hurt or of being offended, but the very possibility of living in a free and flourishing environment as a human being. So how do we listen to someone else speak their mind? I think the first thing needed is humility, admitting, even if it's just to myself, that I don't know everything that I think I know, that I could be wrong about whatever it is that I'm absolutely sure I'm right about. The second requirement is a sense of detachment to try and step out of my way of seeing things, my emotional investment in a situation, which particularly for me, I have a very short temper for those I don't know, is easier said than done. The third requirement is a willingness to experience discomfort, to be unsettled or changed by an encounter. And the final requirement, at least in this list, is that when entering a discussion with someone with whom we disagree, we are seeking to learn something. It might not be that the other person changes our mind, but even then we might come to understand the reasoning behind why they have come to a particular conclusion. Perhaps they are not mad after all, perhaps. So we are not going into battle with the goal of converting a heretic by force of arms to a correct point of view, but instead entering a dialogue with an equal willing only to persuade or be persuaded by the tools of reason and the demonstration of fact. In philosophy, there is what is known as the Socratic method, not trying to win an argument by rhetoric, but to draw yourself and your partner closer to the truth by removing that which can be shown by logical deduction to be false. In other words, the philosopher Socrates is not trying to trick, bully or bribe his debating partner into agreeing a position which he, Socrates, has already decided is true. Rather, Socrates is showing humility in admitting that the only thing he knows for certain is that he does not know. And that by debating with someone else who does claim to know what is true, Socrates is willing to learn. For example, if I admit that I don't know what the meaning of beauty is, but someone else claims that they do know, then by examining their arguments and definition via reason and deduction, one by one, we will come closer to the truth. Even if, as is the end result in many of the early Socratic dialogues, both participants end up agreeing that they don't know as much as they thought they did. And despite how this appears, this is progress, because by discarding what is false through logical argument and deduction, you get closer to what is true. Or is it? Are things quite that simple? Perhaps this is all a bit pie in the sky. After all, we are not robots governed by reason and intellect alone. The rational mind separated from the body, from its passions and appetites. Another favorite philosopher of mine, the German philosopher Nietzsche, opens an early unpublished essay with a story about the origins of truth. And since we didn't have a story for all ages this morning, I think we shall have one now. After I've had a glass of water.
once upon a time, in some way out corner of that universe, which is dispersed into numberless twinkling solar systems, there was a star upon which clever beasts invented truth. That was the most arrogant moment in the whole history of creation. But it was only a moment, for soon the star cooled and congealed, and the clever beasts died with it. Such a tall tale still does not show how limited or aimless and arbitrary our human understanding is when compared to the infinity of creation. For there were eternities when we humans and our so-called knowledge did not exist. And when our star and the earth beneath our, beneath our feet is gone, nothing will remain to show that we were here. The universe goes on, and yet we take ourselves and our knowledge and lives so seriously as if the whole universe turned within them. Okay, well, story over. But Nietzsche's point, in case it was not clear, is that all, all is well and good to pontificate about the value of truth and the onward march of human progress. But in the end, are we not just clever beasts, semi-involved apes with ideas above our station, taking ourselves far too seriously. For we will all die in the end, and the universe will remain unchanged by our presence. But where does that leave us? Hmm. I think there is reason to be hopeful, so I'd like to recap. Firstly, we can admit that we are imperfect that we are finite, created beings. We are not God. And most of us don't have the faintest clue what is going on most of the time, even if we try to convince ourselves and others that we do. Secondly, we have to live together in a confined space, our homes, our streets, our island, even the planet itself is small in the grand scheme of things. This means that we will always be tripping over each other, standing on each other's toes, squabbling over resources, and telling each other tall tales to make ourselves look brave in the face of the darkness that surrounds us and ultimately will engulf us. But, and third, we can use our reason and our intellect to help one another get closer to what is true, even though this is a never ending endeavor, which we cannot hope to complete. This requires courage because by removing what is false, we take away the comforting illusions we would prefer to cling to because we don't like to admit we are not ultimately in control. And finally, and I think most importantly, we require compassion. Because as long as there are humans on Earth, there will be conflict over resources, prestige, belief, you name it, and someone else will want to fight you for it. Given that we are half evolved apes who are squashed together on a bowl of Earth, which will eventually be swallowed by a star, surely the least we could do is to make our short lives easier for one another by showing compassion and using our intellect and reasoning abilities not to dominate one another, but to assist each other and to make our lives fuller and richer. We can hope and a man can but dream. May it be so. Now, our final hymn of the morning is number 158, Dare to, Dare to Think. Dare in words your thoughts. 
benediction this morning. Let us go in peace, proud of our community, at ease with ourselves, holding the light of truth and the light of love. May we think good thoughts, say good words, and do good deeds each day this coming week. Let us receive the blessings of God and reflect them out into the world. May it be so. May we go now in peace. We'll extinguish the light of the candle. Though we extinguish the light of this candle, our faith burns on, our vision remains bright, our fellowship warm, and our yearnings for peace, justice, and the life of the spirit constant. So be it until we meet again. Go now in peace, go now in peace. May the love of God surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go. Go now in peace, go now in peace. May the love of God surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go.
Thank you. Thank you. And now we have uh, gone in peace. We shall go for a brew and come back for a chat. I shall see you in a couple of minutes. Uh, you can feel free to put your kettles on. <laughs>